Hello, everyone, and welcome to MOS Live. Today, you're joining us for our virtual planetarium program called Exploring Space, where two of our educators will fly you through space and show you all of the cool stuff that comes up along the way. Uh, my name is Emily. My pronouns are she and her, and I will be your moderator during this program. So I'll be relaying all of your questions and predictions to our educators. Now, please know that if you're watching us on Facebook or YouTube, we will not be able to see any of your comments, but we are really grateful that you're watching us today. If you are watching us in Zoom, you can use the Q&A button on your screen to uh, share any comments or predictions that you have with us. And we also offer um, closed captions, excuse me. So if you want to see those, you can click on the CC button on your screen and then select show subtitles. So with that, I'm going to ask our educators to turn on their cameras, introduce themselves, and then they'll get started. Hello, everybody. My name is Katie. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm going to be your guide today as we explore space, but all I will be doing is the talking. Hi, everybody. I'm Talia. I use she, her pronouns, and while Katie's doing the talking, I'm doing the flying because I will be your pilot for the day. All right, so today uh, I thought it would be fun to talk about collisions that happen in space. So collisions of all sizes. Um, we're going to start close to home and then hopefully end up out past our galaxy and even farther out than that. There are so many different types of collisions that happen in space, so I don't have time to cover them all, but I've picked a few um, that I think will be really fun to talk about. So Talia, bring us into space. All right, so Talia is using a program called Open Space. Um, it has all different types of data sets and it's a whole simulation of our universe based off of real data. So right now we are looking at our home planet as if we were out floating around it in space. And I wanted to start here because collisions happen with the Earth every single day. We tend to not really notice it because they're not big explosions that are hitting the earth or anything like that. Um, but there are collisions with pieces of rock and dust that are floating out in space. And as a matter of fact, every day over a hundred tons of dust uh, or sand sized particles of debris hit the earth. And sometimes of the year, we'll get more of that material than others. Um, but basically what I'm talking about are meteors. So these tiny pits, uh, pieces of debris enter our atmosphere and they interact with all of the gases. And so they heat up and cause that little streak of light. So we like to call them shooting stars because it kind of looks like a star shooting across the sky. But in reality, it's just a tiny piece of debris that has entered Earth's atmosphere and has burned up. And so a lot of that material enters the atmosphere and burns up, but there's also a significant amount of it that uh, is so small that it just kind of bounces through the atmosphere until it falls to the ground. So it never actually completely burns up. And so we have lots and lots of things called micrometeorites uh, on the surface of the earth. And so we are getting bombarded every day by all of the space material. And uh, I thought we'd start there because it's a collision that we can experience every day. And sometimes of the year, like I mentioned, you can see more of them. Right now, the, P the Perseid meteor shower is going on. So basically, the Earth is moving through a big cloud of debris um, during this time of the year. And so we'll see more and more of these meteorites uh, right now, more than any other times of the year. But they do happen all year long. Staying relatively close by, if we back up a bit, we can see Earth's partner, uh, the moon here that's orbiting around the Earth. Now, when we look up at the moon at night or through a telescope and we look at the surface, you can see that there are lots of craters on the surface of the moon. And that's because the moon has been bombarded with uh, meteors and asteroids throughout its history. The moon and the Earth and the solar system in general are about four and a half 
billion years old. And the moon has remained relatively unchanged because there aren't a whole lot of processes going on on the moon that would change its surface a whole lot. Um, so we see a lot more craters. It also doesn't have an atmosphere, so nothing to protect the surface. So we see a lot of impacts on the surface of the moon. But what's even cooler is that we think that the moon actually formed because of a collision. So back four and a half billion years ago, when the solar system um, was had just formed, it, everything was really hot, uh, lots of gas and dust and debris kind of flying around all over the place. The earth was essentially molten rock at the time. We think that another object about the size of Mars, which by the way is is roughly half the size of the Earth. Um, so an object the size of Mars collided with the Earth, sending lots of material out into space that eventually coalesced um, to form the moon. And we think that this is probably the leading um, theory because of evidence that we see in the composition of the moon and the earth are made up of a lot of the same stuff. Uh, but there are also other theories about how the moon formed. Um, but this one, it's called the giant impact hypothesis um, is the leading theory. So those are some collisions that are fairly close to home. Um, but I get a question a lot of the time about what happens if stars collide. So we're going to move away from our solar system. We're making a big jump here. And we're going to head out into interstellar space. And I will pause here to see if there have been any questions so far. Sure. Thank you, Katie. There is one uh, clarifying question. Jennifer is wondering, what is debris? So maybe what is it and even what is it made of when it is formed during these collisions? Yeah, so debris is basically any uh, remains of rock or dust uh, that happens to be floating out in space. I'm not really talking about debris as in human made debris, like if we were to send a satellite up into orbit and, you know, pieces of the satellite came off or like, I'm not talking about that type of stuff, um, but rather like leftovers from asteroids uh, that have collided or comets, for example. So uh, if a comet comes into the inner solar system, it leaves behind that big cloud of gas and dust. And so the dust is actually a lot of rock and ice that has been kind of shed away from the main part of the comet. So those are the types of materials that I'm talking about, just kind of small pieces of rock and ice that are floating out in space. Wonderful. And I do have one really cool question, and I think it's referring to what you said about how the moon was formed. Uh, Mahiro, age 11, has asked, where did the object hit, and can we go to the crash site to collect samples? That's a really good question. Um, so I'm not sure where current day, uh, like what side of the earth it hit, because at the time the earth was made of molten rock. So there weren't really any land masses or oceans. There were no oceans at the time. So it's hard to say where exactly it would, um, or where it would, uh, what side it would have hit. And also during these early stages in the solar system, the earth did change quite a bit. So after the collision, the earth was still like molten rock. So it still changed quite a bit. Um, and so there's no like actual remaining um, like impact or anything that we could see nowadays. But that's a really good question because we can definitely see some of the remains of asteroids that have hit the Earth, but those are much, much smaller compared to um, this Mars-sized object that we think helped form the moon. All right, awesome questions so far. I'll pause again in a little bit to take some more. But now that we're out floating among the stars, I wanna talk about what happens when stars collide. It's a question that we get all the time and it actually, it doesn't really happen very frequently, so it's not something that we tend to talk about a whole lot. But I wanted to dive in uh, a little bit more and uh, talk about the different ways that stars can collide. So first of all, it's 
it's really rare. Um, in general, stars colliding happens in our galaxy about once every 10,000 years or so. And it tends to happen in regions where there are lots of stars clustered together. So uh, these regions are called globular clusters and we can show you some of their locations in our galaxy. Um, all of the yellow points that Talia just put up for us are locations of globular clusters. And globular clusters are packs of stars that are all uh, close together, and a lot of them are gravitationally bound to each other. And the stars tend to be older stars and smaller stars. Uh, for the vast majority of them. But what astronomers have noticed in globular clusters are these blue stars that appear to be younger um, than the stars around them, which was really puzzling because it doesn't fit uh, the type of stars that usually make up a globular cluster. So one of the theories about how these blue stragglers is what they're called and how they form is actually these younger stars colliding and then forming these um, or excuse me, these smaller stars colliding and forming a bigger, more energetic blue star called the blue stragglers. Um, so that's one of one of the theories about these types of stars. So the mo most of the time when stars collide, um, they are already part of a binary system. So. All of the stars that we see when we look up at the sky at night, they look like individual points of light, but a lot of the times, one of those points of light could actually be multiple stars that are orbiting together. So in our solar system, we only have the sun. The sun is just a lone star by itself, but there are plenty of other stars that have companion stars. And so we call them binary systems or multiple star systems if there's more than two. And so they're gravitationally bound to each other. And sometimes if two stars are really, really close together, um, they will spiral in toward each other. And that's how a collision would happen um, in these globular clusters. Now, depending on the types of stars that are part of the binary system, different types of things can happen. So two regular stars like the sun, if they were to collide, they could potentially make a new star, um, which is what I just mentioned called the blue stragglers. But if one of those stars is a regular star and the other star is the remains of a an average star that's already died. So we call it a white dwarf. Um, if one of the two uh, objects in the binary system is a white dwarf, that white dwarf can steal material from the other star. And it can steal so much material that it actually starts fusion again and the whole outer layers of the white dwarf can explode outward. And so that's called a nova. We talk about supernovas a lot, but a, just a regular nova is actually two stars that have gotten really close together and one star has taken material from the other star and then exploded. Uh, so that's one option that can happen. If it takes like all of the material from the companion star, then the entire white dwarf can explode out into space. And that's another type of supernova. Um, so these are all different options of what can happen when different types of stars orbiting really close together, uh, if they get too close. Um, these are just different scenarios of what can happen. Now, before I move on, I will pause there again and see if there are any more questions about that. Thank you, Katie. Um, I would love to backtrack just for a moment and sure. go back to the moon's formation, just so we can put a little bow on that series of questions. Uh, what happened to the object after it collided with Earth? Yeah, so when the object collided with Earth, um, the material just kind of Expl like not exploded, but just got expelled out into space. So there really weren't any like giant chunks remaining of that object. And Talia, you could probably speak uh, more to this than I can, because I know you know a lot about these moon uh, formation hypotheses. Yeah, so um, this object, Theia, um, we think part of it is now part of the moon. We think there are pieces of Theia um, that went into making the moon. 
there may in fact be pieces of Thea that went into that got incorporated into the earth. And there is a theory that um, rather than Thea just knocking a chunk off of the earth and that chunk coalescing into the moon and just leaving a smaller earth that uh, Thea, because earth was molten and Thea itself was probably um, at least a little soft, if not totally molten, that they actually smashed into each other and sort of combined and formed this giant cloud. And um, most of that cloud recoalesced to become the earth and part of it recoalesced to become the moon, in which case most of Thea would have been incorporated into the earth and the moon. And if it was a solid piece that just sort of went off into space, there was a lot of stuff flying around that inner solar system back then. A lot of it got flung out of the solar system through gravitational interactions with things like the sun or um, the bigger planets. In fact, we think there may have even been, you know, another planet in our solar system and it got flung out. So it's possible the remnants of Theia are actually uh, floating out somewhere in interstellar space, depending on which of these scenarios turned out, turns out to be the most accurate. Cool, thank you, Talia. Um, I have one more really cool question that just came in. Robert is wondering what happens if two supernovas collide? All right, so supernovas, <laughs> yeah, oh, there's so many cool things that could happen here. Um, so supernovas, like, the event of a supernova is an explosion of a really massive star. Um, so if you had like, if you had two really massive stars exploding near each other, I don't know. So the actual explosion wouldn't be what collides, but the aftermath of a supernova can collide. Um, so after a really massive star explodes, it goes supernova, the core of that star will collapse in on itself. And so the core can become one of two different objects. It can become something called a neutron star or it can become a black hole. And we actually have observed these objects colliding. So I'm gonna um, quickly uh, steal the screen from Talia for a moment and show you um, what it would look like if two neutron stars, which happen after supernovas, collide. So this is, um, this is a diagram of a white dwarf star stealing material from a parent star. Um, but then here we have an animation of what it would look like when two neutron stars collide. And I didn't realize there is music attached, so I'll get rid of that. All right. So both of these represent neutron stars. We've also seen this happen with black holes, so you could imagine that they are black holes as well. And so all of those ripples that you see going out into space, those are gravitational waves. So I should mention that neutron stars and black holes are the densest objects in the whole universe, pretty much. Um, black holes more so than neutron stars. And so when they collide, here, let me go back. We could go back to space. There we go. OK, thank you, Talia. Um, so when these really, really dense objects collide in space, that causes a ripple in the actual fabric of space time that we were able to observe um, with our telescopes here on Earth. And it was the first time that we had ever found evidence for these gravitational waves. And it's really exciting because it's a new lens through which to look at the universe. So far, everything that we've studied in the universe has been through light, observing light from um, you know, other stars, other galaxies, looking at light signatures, um, looking at you know, the absence of light when we're talking about black holes. Light has taught us so much about the universe, but gravitational waves is now kind of a new, um, a new lens to look at the universe. And so hopefully, as we learn more about gravitational waves, we'll be able to find out just a whole lot more about our universe by studying them. So Gravitational waves happen when neutron stars or black holes collide. Now, 
after they collide, uh, the actual object that is formed afterward is a black hole. So if two neutron stars collide, they will generally form a black hole. If two black holes collide, then they will form an even more massive black hole. And we think that that's how supermassive black holes form. So black holes that you'd find at the center of a galaxy are much, much bigger than black holes that would form after just a star went supernova. Um, and it's because we think that they have collided with other black holes or maybe um, just ate up a lot of material over the course of their lives. And that's how they get so big. So, uh, since we're talking a little bit more about galaxies now, and I'd like to talk about galaxy collisions because that's another really awesome thing that happens. And we've got some cool pictures of galaxies colliding. Um, and the Milky Way, our own galaxy, is actually on a collision course with our next door neighbor. All right, so Talia has now taken us all the way outside of our galaxy, which we've never seen before. We've never made it out here. Um, if we wanted to send a spacecraft out here, it would take hundreds of millions of years to get something this far away. Even just to get to the nearest star, uh, it would still take about 100,000 years. So. This is a model of what our galaxy looks like. It's based off of observations of other galaxies that we can see through telescopes. It's also based off of measuring the patterns and motions of stars within our own galaxy. So we, we have a good model and uh, it's called a barred spiral. There's different types of galaxies out there, but our particular type is a barred spiral, the middle kind of glowy area is shaped like a bar. So that's where we get the barred uh, part of the name. And then the spiral comes from the spiral arms that we can see. So what happens when galaxies collide? Well, uh, this is a pretty common thing in the universe. And it's because galaxies have so much mass, which means they have so much gravity. So if a galaxy is you know, even remotely in the vicinity of another one, they can become gravitationally bound to each other and orbit each other until eventually they collide. So if, uh, does anybody know the name of our nearest major neighboring galaxy? And if you do, you can type it into the chat. And if you don't, you can put a question mark if you'd like. All right, we are getting a bunch of answers for the Andromeda galaxy. Yeah, that's correct. The Andromeda galaxy, our nearest major neighbor, uh, it's two and a half million light years away. So, um, you know, it's still pretty far away if we're talking about relative distances here. Um, and it's bigger than the Milky Way. It can, it has a lot more stars. Um, the Milky Way has around 300 billion. Andromeda has a trillion. And as I mentioned earlier, it is on a collision course with our galaxy. So they will collide in roughly four and a half billion years. Um, and when galaxies collide, you would think that a lot of the stars and planets and things like that would collide when it happens, when the two galaxies merge, but it's really the material in between the stars that does the colliding. So stars themselves probably won't collide very much um, when the galaxies merge, but gas and dust will. So we think there'll be a lot more stars um, forming after the collision. And once the collision kind of settles down and it stabilizes, our galaxy will be one huge massive galaxy with trillions of stars and it'll lose its spiral shape. So it'll be shaped more like a sphere um, or a blobby shape than it will a spiral. So at that point, our galaxy will be in an elliptical galaxy rather than a spiral galaxy. And they are trying to think of names for our combined galaxy. I think there's Milk Dromeda, there's Milk Milk Amida, I don't know. They're all really bad. I'm glad that we have four and a half billion years to think of something a little bit better. But uh, we are coming toward the end of the show. So we'll see if it, there are any more questions and we'll end by looking at our beautiful galaxy.
Yeah, how about one more quick one? Um, let's see, I'm trying to find it again. I think it was Adriana. Yeah, Adriana, age eight, is asking what would happen if two solar systems collided and what would happen to the planets within them? Oh, that's a good question. So solar systems are um, made up of a star or a star system and then whatever's going around those stars. So in our case, we have eight planets, we have an asteroid belt, we've got moons involved. Another solar system might have several stars, maybe several planets, maybe no planets. Um, but if two solar systems collide, the two things that would probably be doing the colliding would be the stars because they're the most massive objects in solar systems. And so they have the most gravity. Um, so if, if two solar systems were to collide, it would actually be the stars that would kind of orbit around each other. And so you'd get another binary system. And the planets or anything that's orbiting around it, it's hard to say what would happen um, because there's so many uh, strong forces of gravity at work that some planets could get flung out completely. Um, some of them might go closer to the stars. They could have really weird orbits. Again, it's unlikely that planets would collide together because there's a lot of space in between planets. Um, but I imagine that it, something like that could happen. It's really hard to say, but there are solar systems that exist um, or planets that exist around binary star systems. Um, so that is kind of a cool dynamic that ha that does happen that we've observed. Um, and Talia, do you remember any of the names of those solar systems by any chance that have planets with binary stars? I know you talked about it fairly recently. I mean, off the top of my head, I know that uh, Kepler-16 is a binary system uh, cool. with a planet orbiting two stars. The Kepler-16, that would be a fun thing to, a cool thing to look up um, for sure. The planet Tatooine comes to mind too. From Star Absolutely. Wars. <laughs> we call them unofficially. The, these unofficial nickname for planets orbiting more than one star is a, a tattooing. That's what scientists call them amongst themselves. So I cool. love that. <laughs> so Katie and Talia, thank you both so much. Do you want to wave goodbye to everyone? Bye, everyone. All right. And folks, we are officially out of time, but thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, if we did not get to your question, we're actually doing an Ask a Scientist space program at three o'clock today. So you can tune in and try to get your questions answered during that program if you're interested. Uh, if you would like to see any of our other virtual offerings, you can go to mos.org slash mos at home. Uh, if you enjoyed today's program, please consider supporting us by going to engage mos.org slash welcome. And don't forget that you can actually go to openspaceproject.com and do some of this flying around through space that you saw Talia doing today. Uh, so with that, thank you everyone so much and enjoy the rest of your day.